Good evening. I'm just going to walk in. What the heck is the honor? Not any studios. <laughs> the lights, the wrong temperature. Everything is well. okay. Looks good. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so, good evening. We'll begin with a prayer for the spreading of the teachings throughout the length and the breadth of the West by Yong Zin Ling Riboshe, by the force of, of the blessings of the non fallacious three precious gems, and of and the, truth the truth of our, of our pure selfless self wishes. wishes. May the, May the precious, precious Buddhist, Buddhist teachings flourish, flourish and spread to the expanse of all areas throughout the length and breadth of the West. Of the West. For all, all the people who are there together with their people, who have gained teachings and have faith and respect for them, may the all conditions of their verses be practiced, the pure dharma be dispelled, and an excellent and an collection of favorable conditions increase like the waxing moon. And especially, and especially for those who work on methods for accomplishing the flourishing and spreading of the victorious one's teachings, which are the source of benefit and happiness, may they never be oppressed by masses of interference and adverse conditions, and may it spontaneously happen just as we have hoped to be. Now the Heart Sutra. Thus, Thus have I heard, heard once. once. The Blessed One was dwelling in the royal domain of the Vulture Peak Mountain, together with a big gathering of great monks and great bodhisattvas. That time, the Blessed One entered with the Samadhi, which is now as the Dharma is called Profound Illumination. At the same time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, looking at the profound practices of the Kamasandhi knowledge, saw the five skandhas and their natural. Then, through the inspiration of the Buddha, Venerable Shari, Shari Putra said to Avalokiteshvara, How should those noble ones learn who wish to follow the profound practice of transcendent knowledge? And Avalokiteshvara answered, Venerable Shari Putra, whoever wishes to follow the profound practice of transcendent knowledge should look at it like this seeing the five skandhas and their natural emptiness. Form is empty, emptiness itself is form. Emptiness is not separate from form, form is not separate from emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discriminating awareness, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Thus, all the dharmas are empty and have no characteristics. They are unborn and unceasing. They are impure or pure, they can increase or increase. Therefore, since there is emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discriminating awareness, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no appearance, no sound, no smell, no taste, no sensation, no objects of mind, no quality of sight, no quality of hearing, no quality of smell. No quality of tasting, no quality of sensing, no quality of thought, no quality of mind consciousness. There are no need that matters from ignorance old age to death, nor their wearing out. There is no suffering, no cause of suffering, no ending of suffering, and no path, no wisdom, no attainment, no attainment. Therefore, since there is no attainment, Bodhisattvas abide by means of transcendent knowledge. And there is no, no obscurity of eye, they have no fear. They transcend falsity and pass beyond the bounds of sorrow. All the Buddhas who dwell in the past, present, and future, by means of transcendent knowledge, fully and clearly awaken to unsurpassed, true, completely enlightened. Therefore, the mantra of transcendent knowledge. The mantra of deep inside, the unsurpassed mantra, mantra, the unequaled mantra, the mantra which calms all suffering, for there is no deception. deception. In transcendent knowledge, the mantra is proclaimed. O Sharaputra, this is how Mahasaka should learn to follow transcendent knowledge. Then the blessing one arose from that. Saying, 
good inside of the of our book. Profound no, transcendent knowledge should be practiced just as we were taught in the Tapaka Dhaka's religion. And the blessed one that said, said this is that whole gathering were filled with sorrows and Gandharva, their hearts full of joy, praised the words of the blessed one. Now generating bodhicitta with the wish to free all beings, I shall go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, where I reach full enlightenment, inspired by wisdom and compassion. Today, in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind of ten full awakening to the benefit of all sentient beings. As long as space endures, as long as sentient beings remain, until then, I too remain. With the wish to free all beings, I shall go for the refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I reach full enlightenment. Inspired by wisdom and compassion, today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind intent on full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. As long as space endures, as long as sentient beings remain, until then they are too remain. With the wish to free all beings, I shall go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I reach full enlightenment. Inspired by wisdom and compassion, today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind intent on full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. As long as space endures, as long as sentient beings remain, until they have to remain. No so, yeah. tonight, Tony has asked me to talk about the camera. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, I remember. <laughs> so, I'm not sure I know quite what to talk about, what to say, but um, I'll talk about my own relationship to the camera, uh, which began when I went. Turn it down. Okay. I'm hearing an echo. Or he could wear earphones or something. Uh, we have a little echo chamber in the office here. Um, I went to school, boarding school where I was rather miserable until I discovered photography. And being the youngest uh, in the photography um, whatever class, it wasn't really a class, we just took photographs, uh, I was given the oldest camera, this old camera with a lens that you had to pull out and a little hole that you look through to focus and another little hole that you look through to compose and uh, you had to put the film in you had a little spool that you had to attach the film to and then you dropped it into the camera and then you had a detachable back that you had to put on and it was all very uh, um, It, it it was it didn't seem to be sort of together there was something uh, um, I don't know rough about all these elements that you have to it was clunky thank you um, but it worked it was, the, the lens was very sharp and it worked um, you we were given these little light meters. They were called pilot, I 
remember, and they had a little funny screen in the front. Um, they were gray, and you measured your light, and then you set your lens, and you set your aperture, the shutter speed, the lens aperture, and then your shutter speed, and then you focused and took your picture. And it was a, it was not a simple process, but that's how I took pictures. And um, eventually I bought my own camera. Um, I was in Barbados and um, that was a free port. You didn't pay taxes on things. And I bought a Nickermat FTN. This would have been in 1968. And um, it was a it was a real camera and you didn't have to look through two different holes and you didn't have to detach a part of the camera to put a little spool in at all. It was, it was less clunky. And, uh, but basically, um, the lens had uh, f-stops or apertures and the uh, camera body had film shutter speeds that you could set, put your film in, so that the elements that made it all possible were all the same, that made photography possible, that made the control over the amount of light that came into the lens. All of those things were the same. It was just uh, tighter, less clunky. And uh, I, um, I remember that in those years, it's not that there was any great evolution in technology. The, the school had acquired two Pentax Spotmatics, and they they were small, and they they, they seemed to be super um, fancy in their simple design. Uh, however, basically. All that the design provided was a lens, which had a, a lens aperture uh, and a, a body on which you could control your shutter speed and into which you put your film. So it was all basically the same, whether it was an old, old camera, whether it was the Matt FTN, or whether it was the Pentax Spotmatic, they 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 all did the same job of holding the film uh, and determining or con enabling to control the amount of light that came in. Then the lens that was on the camera in those days, the basic lens was a fifty millimeter lens, and they. I don't think that I could have really told the difference between the quality of the different lenses. Um, the Nickermat had a more solid uh, quality to it. The Pentax had a finer quality to it. And the old camera, which was a like a, a Leica 3C or something like that, was... was um, really clunky and uh, awkward to use. Uh, but they all three did the same thing. And I remember we had in the school a Graflex big 4x5 camera, and you slid in the 4x5 film, um, and you looked, uh, again, sort of like the old Leica, you looked through a little window to focus and to and the composition was done. I remember there was a sort of wire mesh frame that you that you could look through to determine what was going to be um, within the um, within your composition. Um, and I suppose that all of these uh, various cameras. 
uh, and using them demonstrated the the fact that these the, they were tools. They were. Uh, it's not that they really brought anything to the process. They were mechanism by mechanisms by which one recorded the light before one. And the lens was particularly important, uh, and the ability to control how much or how long the light that came through the lens exposed the film had to be correct too. But basically, that's all it was. Um, however, uh, the, the advertising for these cameras, the, the amount of um, uh, press, the amount of attention that was given, the amount of titillation that photographers were, were, were uh, provoked by, and, uh, by the camera industry to get us to become interested in the new this or that really, really worked and got us all very excited about the newest this and the newest that. And the newest this and the newest that, there were actually slight technological um, improvements, uh, little hardships that we could endure uh, because the, the uh, the aperture, uh, when you go through uh, uh, called a, um, a reflex camera, you are looking through the lens, you are looking through, a, your eye goes, the image goes through a prism and then bounces off a mirror, and you look through the lens and you see the image uh, as you are seeing it through the lens. And um, when you, uh, in order to see well, see clearly, you want the lens to be totally open. You want the, the aperture not to be closed down like that because then everything would look very dark. You want to see it big so that you can clearly focus. When you then take the picture, the lens has to close down to the aperture that you've chosen f-stop that you've chosen and then open right up again so that you again focus and see what you're doing the lens the lens of the camera have to be calibrated so that the camera recognizes what you're doing when you're changing your uh, uh, f-stop so that it will close down to the right f-stop when you push the shutter that calibration is something that uh, when you put a lens on, you have to you have to somehow establish that calibration. So there were sort of little or rudimentary aspects to the reflex cameras that that were slowly over those initial years working out, and the newer cameras did this a little more smoothly than the older ones. But these were very minor um, adjustments. Uh, I mean, they, they were practical improvements, definitely. Um, and we all uh, uh, evolved along with the cameras, and we expected and hoped for and wished for the newer versions. Uh, and we attributed far more wonder to these new uh, qualities than the qualities actually provided. They definitely did not improve photographs. They just made things a little more practical. And and in my own evolution as I went from this the school's old, old, old like uh, to uh, my knicker mat uh, to eventually feeling that the knicker mat was really adequate. I should have it like on. Not that there was any difference between what the did and what the Nikon did. Uh, it was all some kind of imputation on my part of greater quality to the icon, which was a more robust camera, 
and uh, had the ability to change different um, things like the viewfinder. Um, and so eventually I, I got my talk and I, uh, once I had the Nikon and I had the lens, then I discovered the slightly wider lens, the 35 millimeter lens rather than a 50. So that suddenly I was uh, experiencing a greater breadth of, of information that I could photograph uh, when I aimed my camera. It wasn't this very tight. Um, um, view that, that the, the um, 50 millimeter lens gave me. Um, and then began, oh, well, maybe in addition to the 35 and the 50, I should get something that I could use to do portraits. Of. And so I got a 105, and I remember really liking that. And uh, then I felt I should have another um, body, uh, not just the Nikon FTN, but maybe I should have one uh, slightly smaller Nikon F without the light meter, since I had an a, a outside light meter and I had the FTN that gave me my light. And so suddenly began this sort of mush of equipment in order to satisfy all the needs that I had suddenly begun to realize that I could satisfy. And this process uh, developed. And I remember I, I was living abroad and I came back to live here. And I don't know why, but I suddenly felt I should have new equipment. And I suddenly had new the same thing, an icon FTN and an icon F, and um, the same set of lenses. Um, and then the camera repairman, who I expected my cameras to, to be uh, lubricated once a year, said, you know what you should have is a Leica with a 35 millimeter lens. It's like perfect little simple camera and you'll, I think it's just right for you. And I can remember seeing this camera. He is his partner, uh, the guy who in his shop with him, Charlie, had just revamped uh, a Leica M4 with a 35 millimeter F2 lens. And it was in perfect working condition. And Said you this would be just right for you. And I remember looking at it and feeling it and and taking some um, um, pictures with it or shooting off the shutter a few times and deciding, yes, in fact, it was an essential part of my kit. Again, it did absolutely nothing more than what my icon. F with a 35 millimeter lens did nothing, nothing. Um, it uh, it was a little smaller, uh, but in no way uh, an improvement in terms of its purpose, which was to um, capture uh, the image, an image of the subject matter for me, controlling the focus, that is to say, the, the, the relationship of the different elements in the lens, so that the image that would be projected onto the film would all be sharp particularly with respect to a particular point in the subject matter before me. And the aperture was controllable, and the <coughs> shutter was controllable, but all of those things I could do with any of the other cameras I had uh, so far. Um, it was simply the packaging of those elements that uh, my friend Harry, the owner of the camera shop, 
had persuaded, or the repair place had persuaded me would really help. And the, the, of course, there was the handiwork of Charlie, who, who had, uh, what's the word, reconstructed and, and, and um, um, brought this M4 to sort of mint condition. And I can remember, uh, it cost $700. Mm. And I went to the bank to take $700 out of the bank. And I had never had $700 in my head. I can remember going from the bank to 47th Street, where the camera repair place was with this cash. And feeling nervous about walking through the streets of New York with the amount of cash and going up and giving it to Harry and, and then getting the camera and his showing me how to load it. And, um, and that camera became the camera I used. It was like a little sketchbook that I always had with me. Um, And then I remember I was climbing a wall and I handed the camera to someone hold, uh, or he reached out and offered to help. And then he decided to follow me. And in the process, he forgot that he was holding my camera and it crashed against the wall and needed to be fixed by Harry, of course. And so back it went to Harry, and I can remember the the uh, <laughs> the pain <laughs> uh, of that experience. Uh, of course, you know it's a mechanical device that could be fixed and could be recalibrated and all that. So it got back to being just right. Um, but it was but. In the process of using it, um, it began in my mind to have certain properties of 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 um, perfection um, that that were pure ideas in my mind, but not in any way qualities inherent in the parts of this uh, this tool. Uh, by that time, I was using uh, a wooden camera as my main camera. It was a um, 5x7 Deerdorf, and I had an old German uh, lens, and uh, there were these film holders that you would slide into it to, and then take the holder, the, the, you would slide the black sheet out uh, when you were going to take your photograph to, to, so that the film was being exposed. Uh, so these cameras were simply a wooden frame at the back, um, uh, uh, glass, what is it called? It's, it's got a name, but it's sort of. Do you know um, uh, the glass that's not shiny? It's um, for it's yeah, it's frosted glass, and um, the image from the lens in front goes through the. Uh, bellows uh, onto the glass. And when you look at the glass um, under a piece of black cloth, you are viewing what your lens is aimed at, um, and you are seeing it upside down and backwards. And so that you compose uh, upside down and backwards. Um, when you have focused, which is determined by the distance between the lens and the film, uh, or 
with you, this this glass that you're looking through. When you focus, you are you focus by changing that distance by uh, by a little crank that you that you um, that you turn this way or that, depending on whether you want it to be the lens to be closer to the film or farther away from the film when it's in focus. Uh, something that you determine by holding a loop to the glass uh, and, and getting whatever it is that you want to be in focus. To be in focus. Once it's set, uh, then you have to take the focusing cloth off your head. You have to close your lens down. You have to determine what the light is. You have to see just what the, uh, the shutter speed should be and aperture the f-stop should be you do that with a light meter um, and then once the lens is closed down and cocked you put your film holder into the camera and you remove the dark sheet uh, so that the film is now uh, aim, aiming at the lens with the lens closed and at the moment that you take your picture the lens opens and closes again for the amount of time that you determine should be that the film should be exposed at a particular f-stop. And once you've taken the picture, the lens closes back that down, and then you put the black sheet back in and you take the film holder out. Now that whole long uh, process uh, is uh, basically what photography is and and going through that process and learning that process and, and understanding that process makes you understand uh what a little camera does when you take a picture with a little camera you're going through that same process uh but it's happening very quickly and automatically uh compared to the steps that you have to go through when you're using a view camera. But the view camera, uh, as we try to understand what quality of existence a camera has, the view camera really helps break down the idea of a camera. Now, camera, the word camera means room. And uh, the, the, um, this wooden contraption with a bellows on it is the room. The room, uh, the real name for the camera is camera obscura, and which means dark room. So the dark room is the, is the uh, containment, uh, the container within which light is... Um, uh, allowed in uh, or accept or, or uh, um, for a, at a with the with the what would you call it the the hole the aperture letting the light in being a particular size and the amount of time that light is let in being for a particular amount of time all of that being to, to be controlled by the lens element so you have that lens element that has a shutter in it, and that has a that has a little thing determining how large the hole is that lets the light in. So that is the lens. The other side is the film. The film is that which uh, absorbs the light and is sensitive to light. So you have these two parts of this camera. This camera of this dark room. One is the lens and one is the film. And focus is determined by the distance between the lens and the film and uh, the, the um, amount of light that comes through the lens and the amount of time that light comes through the lens is determined by the lens. Uh, different lenses have different Focal lengths and and the amount of the the, uh, the what you call it the 
width of view uh, of uh, different lenses uh, determines um, how wide a breadth of uh, information before you is then recorded on a particular size film. Um, uh, but that's what a camera is. Uh, the camera is just the box that holds the lens and that holds the the material that um, absorbs or captures light. Um, we now move on to the uh, the digital era. All that has been done in the digital era is that film has been replaced by a, uh, a lens, uh, sorry, a, a light sensitive surface that, uh, that doesn't have to be processed in chemicals in order to hold light. It's not made of little light sensitive. Um, um, I don't know whether it, at one point it was silver particles. Um, it's it's uh, a bunch of tiny little lenses on a surface that um, that has some uh, light sensitive quality, and um, the, the actually uh, all the uh, the actual sensor is able to uh, interpret or capture is the amount of light that falls on it. Uh, color, the interpreting that light and giving it a particular color quality is something that has to be added to the sensor. That's like a, a, a second layer or set of interpolations that have to be done. Uh, but the the initial light sensitive uh, censoring is simply from black to white through a series of uh, sort of smooth gradations of gray, uh, grays, I should, I suppose we should say. Um, the, the, um, the, uh, the way in which color is added to that is, is another story and different uh, camera manufacturers do that in different ways. Um, but basically, a digital camera is simply a camera that, 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 uh, where the light capturing mechanism is uh, digitized rather than it being filmed. Um, and uh, in the olden days, you determine, you would decide what kind of film you were using uh, uh, in respect to the situation, in respect to what you wished uh, to photograph and how you wished to photograph it. Uh, so that the film itself determined certain qualities uh, of your um, final product, and you used a particular film in order to uh, arrive at what it was that you wished to uh, do photographically. The the, um, the digital uh, sensor. Uh, has the ability to do a variety of things uh, from black and white to color, different qualities of color, different sort of textures. All of those things the, the digital uh, sensor is able to do. Uh, it, it can compute and it can then add certain characteristics to the image. Uh, um, which which would uh, 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 would not have been possible in, in film. Film, uh, you you were working towards getting the finest quality uh, image, which you then could uh, add contrast to or diminish contrast, 
it, it, when you were uh, developing, uh, but you go from uh, a black and white image, you couldn't go from color to black and white to any of them. Well, you could actually, you could take negative and you could make a, or your slide and make a, uh, you could make black and white negative out of it. But every step of this way, you would be losing quality, a lot of quality. Uh, and uh, uh, today, all of those things are um, accessible to a photographer uh, by either um, making choices before you take the picture with the sensor or uh, making choices after you've taken the picture and you work on manipulating it in, on your computer. Um, so, uh, sorry? Photoshop. Photoshop, like, uh, I'm sure one, there are many different uh, ways of, uh, of doing this, but, but the, but what's important, I think, to remember is that the mechanism, the, the digital camera, whether it's a super fancy uh, or a simple camera, is simply a uh, light sensitive um, mechanism, a sensor uh, attached to one side of the camera, we we'll call it, a lens. Uh, determines the um, aperture, the uh, size of the hole of uh, light goes through, and then the the uh, shutter, the, the the amount of time that light is exposed to the uh, to the light sensitive material, the sensor. Now, new cameras. Uh, don't even need a, a shutter. Uh, the, the sensor itself has the ability to, let's say, on, uh, be light sensitive, and then not be light sensitive. You don't need a mechanical thing to go um, to, to, um, to control the amount of time that light is hitting the sensor. Um, the, the lens does have this um, up to now need to actually um, control how open the it, it will be the of the aperture, and the aperture uh, when you have it very wide open, then uh, your the mount of photographing that will be in focus will be far more shallow. And as you close your lens down, the amount that is in focus, what's called the depth of field, is greater. And a photographer wishes to control that, and he controls it by determining, by choosing uh, either a, a, an open, um, aperture or a closed down one. So these these little controls that, that the photographer uses to create certain visual quality. Um, uh, these controls are uh, the the controls that that you wish to have in creative process, but um, the camera maintains its very basic quality. It is simply a lens, a light sensitive um, uh, surface, and the box that holds all that together. That's it. And uh, I think that, uh, it becomes a, a, not only does the sort of basic uh, quality of the camera become interesting to, to uh, maintain one's awareness of, uh, 
the, the way in which all these sophisticated evolutions to the camera uh, begin to play with our idea of the photography is somehow magical, uh, that the camera is somehow magical, that there's something more to it than uh, all of that more to aspect is simply our own mind um, to uh, romanticize, uh, give some kind of uh, truth to, uh, or give some kind of actual uh, mythology to uh, stuff that doesn't exist, uh, stuff really sit down and analyze the makeup camera uh, aren't there. Uh, the camera is a very basic, simple thing. It's a black box with a light sensitive uh, side and a lens that's light. And uh, the rest is, is simply projection from um, let me just look at <clears throat> scribbles. So, um, when we talk about camera, uh, the, we can say that the camera is dependent. When I, I'm saying camera now, uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm talking about those mechanical devices that we all say are cameras. But uh, in order for a camera to be a camera, it is dependent on the lens, the light sensitive um, surface, whether it's film or um, uh, a digital sensor, uh, and the contraption that holds those two together. And uh, so the camera uh, is a dependent arising. It is it is a it is dependent on those parts. Uh, there's nothing independent. There's nothing inherently existing about any of those uh, about the camera. Uh, if if it if in order for a camera to function as a camera, it has to have a lens. It has to have a light sensitive uh, uh, surface. It has to have the, the uh, dark box that holds these two elements. It, it is dependent on those things. It is independent. The, the whole notion of something being Dependent uh, counters any quality of independence, counters any quality of inherent existence, existence that is not dependent, but that is uh, that exists in and of itself. And so that this this, um, this contraption, the camera, is a is a is a wonderful. Um, let's say reflection of or example of our interdependent uh, existence. And if we look at it from the other side, um, in order to be able to capture an image, in order to be able to capture something before one, one needs something that has the ability to capture. One needs light sensitive uh, side uh, so that uh, that is an element of the camera that is necessary. Photography depends on that. Photography depends on the lens that controls the, the, the quality of the image that is captured by the light sensitive. Um, uh, side. And if you have a lens and you have a light sensitivity, and if you don't have the 
dark box that holds these, you're not going to get anything because uh, in order for the light to be controlled and projected upon the light sensitive um, material, you need that dark box. You need the uh, dark um, uh, room, the camera uh, obscura. Uh, so that the, the, the whole process of photography is dependent on these parts. Uh, and in that uh, it is dependent on these parts, it is in no way uh, independently existent, uh, uh, inherently existent, intrinsically existent, uh, because these qualities of intrinsic existence, inherent existence, are uh, the opposite of dependently existent. Uh, and, I, and I'm sort of working this because I think that uh, the more we um, explore the idea of dependence being uh, what explains emptiness, uh, the more we are dealing with emptiness um, by means of the elements that really demonstrate uh, the impossibility of inherent existence, demonstrate the, 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 the simple, basic, uh, evident logic of interdependent origination uh, being the, the meaning of emptiness. Um, I think that's about as much as I can say on the subject of the of the camera, uh, Tony. It wasn't about the camera. <laughs> yeah. the camera was a need. An explanation. And, and it's, it's easy to think about. I think that uh, I think it's also interesting to realize uh, the the way uh, cam camera manufacturers um, uh, work at uh, projecting a quality uh, of inherent quality, inherent perfection to their um, uh, what's it called material their That's a real uh, sense of possession <laughs> yeah and um, the way your desire your attachment is tickled by these manufacturers and the way in which your um, belief in the importance of more and more megapixels in order yeah. to uh, achieve a, a, a greater and greater uh, quality of image, uh, that all of these things are, um, I don't want to suggest that the camera, that the more expensive, finer uh, camera is not good or necessary. Uh, think that uh, tools can be of better quality and of less good quality, but um, it's very easy in the process to think that there is some inherent specialness to something uh, when in fact um, it's simply a bunch of parts that are put together in a particular way in order to fulfill a, 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 a purpose. And um, either those parts are necessary uh, or they aren't, they are superfluous. And uh, when you're choosing a camera, <laughs> don't be fooled by those numbers. Really focus on the, the tool, the elements, the, the, uh, the dependent <laughs> arising, the, the, the uh, fulfills your particular task uh, if you're a photographer. 
Um, if you're not, then you might as well use your phone. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> Do you have any questions, Bob? <laughs> not questions, but a lot of things ran through my mind. Like, for instance, you don't need to be able to make a camera to be a photographer. You don't need to be able to make a camera to be a photographer. Yeah. You can buy. So that would be one way of understanding the process and the fact that it is a dependent arising because you would have to make every single little piece of the horizon that that's what it is. Yes. Well, I also had uh, Caravaggio and Van Dyke guys running through my mind in terms of images. The, the light, the brain is the light sensitive thing. Our bodies and our eyes are like the lenses. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We are, but uh, you need very good memory to be able to right. hold on. <laughs> uh, no. There are certain caravans that one can rectify that we live. And, uh, mm -hmm. I was Italian, you know. Uh, <laughs> Names? Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> So we shall recite the Sutra of the Recollection of the Noble Three Jewels. For whom? Darren, who? Audrey and Neff. Audrey and Neff. And we're being asked to remember Audrey and Neff in our prayers. I prostrate to the omniscient one, one. thus the Buddha, Bhagavata, Tathagata, Arhat, Samyatya, Samyatya, the learned and virtuous one, the Sugata, the knower of the world, the charioteer and tamer of beings, the unsurpassable one, the teacher of devas and humans, is the Buddha Bhagavata. The Tathagata is in accord with all merit. He does not waste the roots of virtue. He is completely ornamented with all patience. He is the basis of the treatments of metaphors of merit. He is adorned by the minor remarks. He blossoms with the flowers of the major remarks. His activity is timely and appropriate. Seeing him, he is without disharmony. He brings true joy to those who long with faith. His knowledge cannot be overpowered. His strengths cannot be challenged. He is the teacher of all sentient beings. He is the father of the Bodhisattvas. He is the king of noble ones. He is the guide of those who journey to the city of Nirvana. He possesses immeasurable wisdom. He possesses inconceivable confidence. His speech is completely pure. His melody is pleasing. One never has enough of seeing him. His form is incomparable. He is not stained by the realm of desire. He is not stained by the realm of form. He is not affected by the formless realm. He is completely liberated from suffering. He is completely and utterly liberated from the skandhas. He is not possessed with doctors. His ayatanas are controlled. He is completely cut the mouths. He is completely liberated from extreme torment. He is liberated from craving. He is crossed over the river. He is perfected in all the wisdoms. He abides in the wisdom of the Buddha Bhagavad's rise in the past, present, and future. He does not abide in nirvana. He abides in the ultimate perfection. He dwells on the Bhumi where he sees all sentient beings. All these are the perfect virtues of the greatness of the Buddha Bhagavad. The holy Dharma is good at the beginning, good at the middle, and good at the end. Its meaning is excellent. Its words are excellent. It is uncorrupted. It is completely perfect and completely pure. And completely purified. The Bhagavad teaches the Dharma well. It brings complete vision. It is free from sickness. It is always timely. It directs one further. 
seeing it fulfills one's purpose. It brings discriminating insight for the wise. Bhagavad is revealed in Pramili Vinaya. In his renunciation, he causes one to arrive at perfect enlightenment. It is without contradiction. It is pithy. It is trustworthy and puts an end to the journey. As for the Sangha of the great Yana, they enter completely, they enter insightfully, they enter straightforwardly, they enter harmoniously. They are worthy of veneration with joint palm. They are worthy of receiving prostration. They are a field of glorious merit. They are completely capable of receiving all gifts. They are an object of generosity. They are a great object of complete generosity. The protector who possesses a great kindness. The omniscient teacher, the basis of oceans of merit and virtue, I prostrate to the Alagata, pure the cause of freedom from passion, virtuous, liberating from the lower realms. This alone is the supreme ultimate truth. I prostrate to the Dharma, which is peace. Having been liberated, they shall show the power of virtue. They are fully dedicated to the disciplines. They are wholly filled with merit and possess virtue. I prostrate to the Sangha. I prostrate to the Buddha, the leader. I prostrate to the Dharma, the protector. I prostrate to the Sangha of the community. I prostrate respectfully and always to be The Buddha's virtues are inconceivable. The Dharma virtues are inconceivable. The Sangha's virtues are inconceivable. And in faith in these inconceivable, therefore, the Buddha's virtues are inconceivable. They can be more than a completely pure. Thank you.